This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 530, recorded on January 11th, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in New York City, Dixon Pommier. Hello there, Vincent. I haven't seen you in ages. Really? How many ages? <laughs> the dark ages? <laughs> also joining ages. us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Well, Kathy. How are you? Hey. Good. Good. It's a beautiful blue sky day. Yeah, we got one. And you know that we don't have those in the winter so often, so it's especially nice. Right. It's minus four Celsius. <laughs> exactly. It's about the same year. It's like below yeah. freezing, right? Yeah, it's yeah. that cold. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. It's a blue sky day here and really cold, minus and 5C. Do you have the wind that we have, Alan? Yeah, we have it's breezy. Yeah. yeah. We had 40 mile an hour winds yesterday. Oh, yeah, the, the was house windy. was creaking, the branches were coming down. Yeah. Crazy. Our guest today is right here in studio in New York City. He is a professor in the Howard Hughes Medical Institute of Columbia University. Steve Goff, welcome back. Yeah, hi. Steve. I'm glad it's to your, be here. It's your third TWIV. That's right. right. The first one was... Sitting uh, in his favorite chair. Number 76, <laughs> XMRV. Way back. Yeah. And then 337, Steamer. Ah, yep. And today, three different topics, really. Right. That shows we cover the waterfront, <laughs> don't we? Yes. yes. So Steve's lab p- published a paper recently. We're going to talk about that. But first, a few items of business. This Week in Virology wants to learn more about you, the listeners of TWIV. Please take five minutes to answer a short 12-question survey to help us collect data. We need to seek sponsorship. You can find the survey at asm.org slash poll asm.org slash T-W-I-V-P-O-L-L. It's pretty easy to remember. I think so. So even if you're driving or exercising or pipetting, TwivPoll, we have... But if you're driving, don't start entering that into your web browser. No. No, you you should just remember TwivPoll. TwivPoll at asm.org. And um, we have 300 responses. We want 1,000. That means that way we will get a properly powered study. But the same 300 can't submit again no they won't be able to <laughs> you, well, you do say that three times you'll have a thousand <laughs> you, you say that's a properly powered study but it's not a random sample no it's not no no they're self-selected so, yeah. uh, and there's, only people who want to respond is that what you mean yeah, yeah. And there's no control i mean you know you right know, <laughs> you know can't imagine central what station <laughs> at five o'clock in the afternoon and randomly picked people. randomly no, pick but this has to be listeners i, I it is uh, a subset well, yeah, of yeah, listeners yeah. but it, you're right it is the people who volunteer right so it's not random right it's true yeah i guess it's a certain type of person who answers a poll right People with time, you know, time on their hands. It's funny. Five minutes. I got a poll from the American um, Arbor Day Society and the National Arbor Day Society, and they wanted me to answer a 12-question questionnaire, and I did. And at the end of it, of course, it had a fundraising message at the end. And in that case, you know, so I— We don't have a fundraising message at the end, no. We don't. We but don't. we want to use it for fundraising. We but want to use it, it but to it's something asked. to think about. <laughs> right. Don't we, forget. We do that. have a fundraising message at the end of the episode. Right. We do. But this um, um, will help us to get ads, we hope. Yeah. Because you provide this information to adver- potential advertisers. And That's you can say, right. look, uh, X percent of our listeners are this or that. So these are very easy questions. And last Please time, don't boycott the poll because you don't want ads on Twiv. <laughs> yeah, right. It's true. Yeah. It may not ever happen, but I would right. like, I'm interested in who's listening. And so please just tell us that. And last time we did this, we had a thousand respondents and it took probably a month or two. Hmm. So we'll keep doing it. But uh, we go, we have to have a good P value, right? One would think. Kathy, do you want to say anything about ASV? Sure. That abstract deadline is February 1st, and in fact, the president just tweeted a little multiple-choice tweet about it today. Um, That's the president president of ASV, by the way. President of ASV, right, sorry. Not any other presidents. We we needed that clarification. (laughs) The 
important things are that if you want to apply for travel funds or if you need a, a sponsor for your abstract, the, a sponsor needs to be a, a full dues-paid member. If you want to apply for travel funds, you need to be a, a dues-paid member. So you should work on your membership even if you don't have the content of your abstract ready just yet. Mm -hmm. I want to point out um, a couple of uh, careers and education workshops that are going to be at this meeting. There'll be one about imposter syndrome. Uh, and, it's hard to find speakers for that. <laughs> and Imposters. my Google, my Google Docs has just gone totally kaflui. Oh, it's back. Uh, and there's a dinner slash boot camp for assistant professors. It was quite popular last year. It'll be a little bit different this year. And there's a teaching workshop that's going to be focused on having effective team projects in your classroom. So those are some additional things besides the regular plenary sessions, keynote address, workshops, posters. There's these other things that you might find interesting. And while a combination dinner and boot camp may sound unappetizing, it's probably very useful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, that's Minneapolis. The last time you gave a keynote, Steve Goff. Yes. It was in Minneapolis many, at ASV. Many years ago. Would it, yes. would it be five years ago or maybe, more? Maybe more. Uh, it's 2011. Yeah, there you Six go. Six years, seven years. Wow. wow. Time flies. It does. I want to remind everyone of two other meetings, the European Congress of Virology, April 28th through May 1st in Rotterdam, which is in? The Netherlands. Thank you very much. The world's largest port city. Yeah, you said that last time, and I was astounded, and I remain astounded. Well, is it still? I believe so. <laughs> yeah. Is it true? Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, Dixon well, says things. Is it true? Uh, you never know. <laughs> okay. okay. No, Facts. I, 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 Fact I check. Fact check. Time. Dixon says things, and then people send emails and say Dixon didn't get That's that That's how right. we know who's listening. Well, <laughs> ecv2019.com, Euro mm. European Congress of Virology, ecv2019.com. Abstracts are due March 1st. So Google comes up with Shanghai and then... Uh, largest <laughs> port in Europe is uh, Rotterdam. Rotterdam. Oh, did I forget to say that? <laughs> <laughs> so Shanghai until, is the world? Is that until right? 2004, it was Rotterdam, and uh, then it was overtaken by Singapore and then Shanghai. Nice. So Dixon, in 1623, what was the largest port in the world? Uh, 1623, London probably. That could have been Rotterdam. It was Rotterdam. Because that wasn't the Dutch East wow. India Company at its height about then? Yeah, but so was the, uh, Eng the English. British uh, the East yeah, the too. British East. Yeah, but the Dutch East India Company basically ruled the world. Oh, okay. All right. Do you like history, Steve? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Also, if virology is your passion, share your recent research at the ASM Clinical Virology Symposium. This is happening May 5th through 8th in Savannah, Georgia. Mm -hmm. That's a good place. I like Savannah. Savannah's great. Oh, I, I hope you're going to mention Cold Spring Harbor. I don't know if you're going to I, I wasn't that. going to, but oh, I, I'm should. happy to. Yeah, so every year the retrovirus meeting, again, is in May. Abstract deadline coming up. So hmm. that's our favorite meeting. We did a TWIV there last year. Right. And we've been invited back. Great. To another one. Uh, the ASM Clinical Virology Symposium Abstract is due March 8th. Registration is open. You can go to asm.org. Dot CVS hmm. for more information. And it's not a drugstore, <laughs> right? <laughs> All right. Now, we, um, you published a paper not too long ago, Steve, that we, we have you here to talk about in um, Nature. NP220 mediates silencing of unintegrated retroviral DNA by Zhu, Wang, Shingas, and Goff. And we wanted to talk about it, but let's get a little background and I pulled up another paper, which I think is good background, uh, from a cell host microbe, 2016, I guess. Histones are rapidly loaded onto unintegrated retroviral DNA soon after nuclear entry. So let's start with a basic review of what happens when a retrovirus infects a cell. Great idea. Sure. So those those papers address together uh, kind of a longstanding question in the field, which is, yeah, what happens in the very first hours of infection. And it answered or dealt with a puzzle that had been standing in the field for a while. So, um, yeah, so what happens? So when a retrovirus comes into a cell, it gets into the cytoplasm in a number of different ways, depending on the virus and the cell. And the key first step, of course, is the reverse transcription of the 
RNA genome into a linear double-stranded DNA, and that happens in the cytoplasm within a within a particle sort of <laughs> structure uh, uh, remaining to be elucidated, uh, sometimes called a RT complex, RTC. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that DNA then still in some sort of particle with some capsid protein still present is imported into the nucleus, and again in different ways for different viruses. Um, and that DNA then integrates into roughly random positions in the cellular genome. Mm -hmm. So those steps all take place over the course of yeah, roughly a day, depending on the virus. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the observations, and we can talk about the circumstances where it was discovered, one of the observations was that that unintegrated DNA is not expressed. It's very potently silenced. There's no mm -hmm. really transcription from that unintegrated DNA. Um, and and after it integrates in most permissive cells, then mm -hmm. quickly transcription ensues and you proceed on with the infection. Now, when the DNA gets in the nucleus, before it integrates, what are the forms? So in the cytoplasm, the uh, product is really a single form. It's a linear mm -hmm. double-stranded DNA. Okay. And as soon as you get into the nucleus, that linear DNA persists. It's still the majority species, mm -hmm. but there are two circular forms that then appear. Mm -hmm. And one of those is a so-called 1LTR circle, one is a 2LTR circle. Um, they are formed by the cell. They're uh, evidence of failure from the point of view of the virus, mm. in that those circular DNAs aren't going to be able to persist very long, and they don't represent normal products that are that are important mm -hmm. but they're they're handy to us because they are indicators of successful entry into the nucleus um, they're they're dealt with by products in the cell that are of interest to our friend Lorraine Symington um, mm -hmm. the ends can be ligated together to form the two LTR circles or recombination between the repeats at the ends of the DNA give rise to the one LTR circle so the cell sees these and thinks they're damaged and tries to, re this is non-homologous end joining. Correct. Puts them together, but for the virus, that's not a good thing. Not a good right? thing, right. Because those can no longer integrate, integrate. into the right. genome. So as the cells proceed on and divide, those are going to get diluted right. out and lost. It's very important to remember that there's no replication origins on any of the right. retroviral DNAs. So if they don't integrate, they're going to, eventually go away. Now, this is what you said before is really interesting on a personal level. You said the, the circles give you markers, right? And that's because you can do PCR across, and you get a unique sequence. And that's a paper published in 1980. The authors are Shoemaker, Goff, Gilboa, Paskind, Mitra, and Baltimore. And I, I know all those people because we were all in the same <laughs> lab together. This was when we were still there. And Chuck Shoemaker, the first author... When I left the lab, I, I, he disappeared, and I saw him a few weeks ago in, in Tufts. He's at the vet school, right, right. And, and he came up to me. We're doing a TWIV, and he goes, boy, you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> <laughs> now, wait. In your 1980 paper, you didn't do PCR, though. No. No, no in fact— okay. the, the, That would have been really <laughs> impressive. Yeah, really. <laughs> so, unique junction, basically. It is. Yeah. And, and, and the way we could see those back then was all by Southern blot, basically. Uh. So if you ran a gel of the acutely infected cells, you would see all these forms. You'd see the linear, and you'd see the two circular forms running as separate bands on a southern gel. This paper is one of m many with different combinations of those authors, which I remember came out just detailing the whole reverse transcription process. It's right. really remarkable. Yeah, no, it was, right. it was a, a collaboration that was great fun. Yeah. I think of Ellie Gilboa as maybe being the, the leader. Mm -hmm. um, but there were... You know, step after step in the process yeah, yeah. of reverse transcription that we cool. that we worked out. Now, Any, when a, when a single particle gets into a cell, does it make multiple DNAs from the single genome or just one? Yeah, I mean the efficiency is less than one. So, <laughs> okay. um, so less than one. <laughs> you, you know, several RNAs get have to be typically delivered to even get one DNA made. But another thing I was telling Dixon about is that the DNA product of infection is not ever a single copy of one of the RNAs mm, 
Right. So it's important to remember there are two RNAs per virion particle, and the DNA product is actually recombinant because reverse transcriptase, as it's copying, mm-hmm. hops back and forth between right. the two of them. So, so where does the double-stranded DNA come from then? Well, you make one strand in this copying yeah. way, oh. and then you initiate a interesting RNA, second yeah. site <laughs> no, uh, with a primer and make the second DNA strand I'll be darned. from that first DNA strand. Huh. In the diploid virion, are the two strands of RNA most of the time identical or most of the time not identical or yeah in a in a typical pure virus stock they are supposed to be identical they are more or less identical subject to the limitation that uh the process of replication is so error prone that there's typically uh roughly one or a few mutations every time a, mm-hmm. a copy of is made so they might typically have you know one or two or three base differences between them but a pure stock of Maloney murine leukemia virus in general will have two mm. nearly identical genomes packaged per particle. Now, when you say that there are one and two LTR circles and linear DNAs in the nucleus, that's looking at a population of cells, right? Because any one cell is just going to probably have one. Yeah, it's very hard to get multiplicity of infection very much higher than one. Yeah. You can and get a few. You, if you really push it, you could get maybe 10 Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. per cell, and they would be this combination. But in the real world, I think infection is so, the titers are so low uh, that probably every cell gets, you know, got it less than one DNA molecule. Now, the work that, uh, this paper from 1980, most of the work you did in David's lab and a lot from your lab has been with Maloney, le- murine leukemia virus. Right? right, and we think of that as the prototype. It's the, you know, E. coli, if you will, of the <laughs> retrovirus world. Right. And it, and it it was chosen by the people in the early days because it was the virus that the mammalian virus that grew with, at the time to the highest titer yeah and you know easiest mm-hmm. to handle mm-hmm. a virus of convenience yes exactly mm-hmm. but since then of course many people have have worked on HIV yes I and guess it, and, it's easier to get funded <laughs> among other things right yeah and and it could be argued it has more importance to yeah, yeah, yes, course, some people here. Yes. Right. But the paper today's the two papers are both on Maloney. Right. And right. and my lab works about equally now, I would say half and half on Maloney and, and HIV. Um, okay. Now this paper from nine, from twenty sixteen, which the authors are Gary Wong, Ying Wong and Steve Goff, you <laughs> <laughs> and Gary Wong I was on his thesis committee, I think. I think right? You were, yep. So I heard all this. Histones are rapidly loaded onto unintegrated retroviral DNA soon after nuclear entry. So maybe you could summarize what you did there and what you found. Right. So that was so as I said, the the observation long ago was that the unintegrated DNAs aren't well expressed. Mm-hmm. And I think that raised every, the question in everybody's mind, well, what's the status of that DNA? Why isn't it mm-hmm. transcribed? Um, and I guess if people were asked before that, they would have said, well, there's something wrong with the DNA. It's not accessible. Maybe it's still wrapped up in the particle. Who knows? What? Maybe it, it's not histone covered, and that's why it's not transcribed. Uh, something's wrong. And then after integration, now it's it's in the correct form for transcription. So we just said, well, we better look. <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. techniques like CHIP uh, were available, had become available in ways they were not in the 80s. So that's chromatin that's IP, chromatin yep. precipitation. right? So we can use antibodies that detect histones mm-hmm. and ask whether those antibodies will bring down uh, the viral DNA. Mm-hmm. So we used that method to look, uh, and we tested whether the unintegrated DNAs were indeed histone covered, and in fact they are. Mm-hmm. Um, it's one of the conveniences about Maloney is that you can control the course of the infection in handy ways. So. Um, we have mutants that lack the integrase, so all the DNAs remain unintegrated. So we ha- are able to mm-hmm. establish circumstances where we have infection where all the viral DNA is unintegrated. Yeah, it's um, nice because you don't have to depend on those unintegrated circles because that would be a low signal, right? Yeah, I mean, you, we get everything, the linears and the circles all yeah. present, nice. unintegrated yeah. and no integrated. You can do it with drugs, too. You can block the integrase mm-hmm. with drugs. Mm-hmm. Um so that's one 
one nice handy aspect of the experiments. Another is we can ask whether nuclear entry is required or not, because we can also block nuclear entry very nicely. And that's something we can do with Maloney murine leukemia virus that we can't really do with HIV. Mm -hmm. And that's because Maloney absolutely requires cell division and nuclear division uh -huh. for nuclear entry. So if we block mm -hmm. cell division, which mm -hmm. is easy to do, mm -hmm. then the virus enters just fine, cool. makes DNA nice in the cytoplasm, but fails right. to put it into the nucleus. Right. So I have a question that's basic to this, uh, everything, I guess. I, I should know the answer, but I don't. When this DNA finally gets into the nucleus and it is instantly covered with histones, where do those histones come from? Or is there a pool of free histones in the nucleus that are just hanging around waiting for HIV to show up? <laughs> it's not. They're not probably <laughs> waiting for that, but there are <laughs> pools of the histones, and they're needed in rapidly dividing cells oh, okay. at, at a, at a, yeah. at a very high clip. So they're being made, you know, to coat in the, the chromosome in the nucleus. Right. So there's, so, well, they're, the they're translated right. like everything in the cytoplasm, but they're rapidly oh, okay. imported into right. the nucleus for that purpose. Right. So maybe you could summarize this, this, this whole idea of DNA being able to be expressed and histones and chromatin and modifications and so forth. What, and when did we start to understand that histones could control transcription? Mm -hmm. Well, so that, I think, centered around uh, the discoveries of histone modifications, probably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in vitro studies tended to suggest the histones were repressive right. in that they tended to block access of DNA. Uh, and indeed, it, at promoters, the, they do need to be moved out of the way to allow positive acting transcription factors to bind to the DNA. Um, and mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we know some of the, the chromosome, chromatin modifying machinery that allows for that to happen. The sniff switch complex, mm -hmm. for example, that my wife worked on. Right, um, right. But uh, further studies were showed circumstances where histones were positive for transcription. And I think those in vitro things were hard to interpret and unclear. Mm -hmm. um, as people learned about the modifications to histones, then there became, I think, clearer in vivo data that histone modifications and histones could have really big effects. Mm -hmm. And we learned that acetylation was associated with positive mm -hmm. uh, transcription and that various specific histone methylations could be either repressive or activating. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, this, this is now a huge and, and very active field where we now are studying the, the so-called writers, the readers, and the erasers of, mm. of all these marks mm. that are right. placed on histones. Mm. Yeah, so when, I was, when I was just first learning of this, it, the histones were just some object that the DNA was wrapped on to store it. Right. Right. And then over over the past, as you've just d described over the past, you know, couple of decades, there's been this realization that they're they're a fundamental process of the gene regulation machinery and and really kind of controlling things here. Right. Would you say that the term epigenetics now almost exclusively refers to this aspect, or or do some people think of other kinds of epigenetics? I mean, I I taught a course this fall and. Uh, of students writing their grants and they were all from different departments and it was all uh, almost all things about histone modification and, and hmm. they were just talking about this as epigenetics and I, I always thought of that term as uh, maybe not being necessarily just associated with histone modification. I always thought you know, it was broader than that. I, I bet it would include DNA methylation, for example, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, certainly I bet Tim Bester would. And, um, you know, so I guess yeah. I guess any covalent change to either DNA or histones would be associated okay. with epigenetic changes. I've, okay. I've heard it sure. applied to all, like even as far as microRNAs. I mean, depending on who's, who's talking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could think of it as, as uh transmission of, of in status and Trans information. Transmission of information not encoded in the DNA. Mm -hmm. Like exactly. RNA editing? Do you think RNA editing? Is no. I mean, that's another step in gene expression. Yeah, right. But, that's, that's a but it's modified radio. after the gene has been transcribed. Yeah, but it's still right. genetic. So it's, it's not, uh, it's not, it's not encoded it's not epi. Epi. Yeah. So in general, the acetylation of histones is associated with opening up histones so it can be transcribed, right? Yeah, and, and um, 
that's not the only uh, mechanism by which it, mm-hmm. they act. So we heard from candidates being recruited at Columbia today, yesterday mm. that there are readers of the satellite that act in other ways than opening chromosomes. Okay. So there are acetylases, histone acetylases. They're enzymes that put on the acetyl. Acetyl transferases. Acetyl transferases. It hats, and then, so-called. Yeah. And then there's histone deacetylases, right? Yeah, yeah. HDAX. HDAX. And you can have inhibitors of HDAX, which will open up, will keep the DNA open so it's transcribed, right? Right. So we think it's that a there's confusing. a, it is. <laughs> so we, we have to, uh, I guess, realize that there's a, a these are very dynamic yeah. uh, and there's a continual ongoing acetylation and deacetylation mm-hmm. um, and the, the steady state amount of acetylation um, will be a, a function of the relative uh, activities of those two. So one of the, the really terrific mm-hmm. drugs is is tractostatin A, TSA, mm-hmm. which is an HDAC inhibitor. Right. There's a whole slew of HDAC inhibitors, but their addition kills that deacetylation, and therefore the level of acetylation builds up. So a lot of them are FDA approved. These HDAC inhibitors. Yeah. So what kinds of conditions are they approved? So they're, um, you know, I don't know. They're being tried. I know for cancers. Yeah. I mean, they they have. It's kind of a hand grenade uh, level uh, <laughs> effect, but of course those are used uh, for lots of different things. But it's they have very drastic and often global effects on expression. So if you take one, if you take a cell worth with integrated Maloney, if you treat it with an HDAC inhibitor, you get increased you get expression. More, yeah, um, I think that was in one of these papers yeah, actually. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and one of the stories is of of note is that this uh, unintegrated DNA um, is very much stimulated by HDAC in humans. Mm-hmm. So beyond the fact that, okay, there were now histones loaded on right. um, this unintegrated DNA, um, we were able to look at whether the modifications and marks that were placed on them mm-hmm. would account for the fact that they are silenced, and indeed that seems to be the case. So they are methylated in, a, in an inhibitory way. Correct. And they are also acetylated? They tend to be deacetylated. deacetylated. Right. Is it acetyl or acetyl? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think it's acetyl on which side of the Atlantic you're on. <laughs> yeah. We, go, we tend to use acetylated and deacetylated. Niche uh, or niche? Acetylated. <laughs> acetylated, yeah. Kathy, what do you say? This is the real answer here. <laughs> no, it isn't. But I, <laughs> sure I say acetylated. So acetylated. do I. Good. That's what I say. I do too. <laughs> acetylated. That's right. Uh, acetyl CoA. Uh, is the donor? Acetyl-CoA. I believe that's right. I say acetyl CoA. <laughs> so acetyl CoA. Yeah. I, I do. I say acetylated, but acetyl CoA. I have to yeah. say, whenever I teach and I say, I always think I got it wrong. You know, because I say, "Oh, is that the right way to say it?" Because <laughs> I don't use it enough, I guess. Um. So, and they you looked at so the, your circles were not only coated with histones, but they were. Deacetylated. Yeah, not just the circles. They're all the circles and the linear. And the linear is uninte- everybody Everything unintegrated uninte- had okay. had this property that the histones that were loaded were tended to be deacetylated and they tended to have H three K nine trimethylation, which is a silencing mark. So it's histone three lysine number nine. Correct. And actually you can buy antibodies that will specifically recognize these marks, right? right? Yeah, it's really amazing now the availability of incredibly specific yeah. antibodies for mo- many, many of these marks. In fact, we, some time ago, we did a paper, I don't know if everyone remembers, but it was about reactivation of latent herpes viruses, which begins with a phospho, a phosphorylation adjacent to one of these methyls on histone, which partially activates, and then it becomes modified further. So it's a phosphomethyl That's switch. Nice. And they were using antibodies specific for the different. It's just remarkable. It's just remarkable what you can do. Yeah, I mean, we're only going to be thinking here about three or four <coughs> modifications, but there are actually, you know, mm-hmm. as many, many as a hundred different modifications. So let me, let me ask you: when so retroviral DNA comes in the nucleus, many viral DNAs also come in the nucleus. Do they suffer a similar fate? Yes, we we think that's right. And um, for herpes, for example, David Knight. Our friend mm. is probably the one of the mavens of the mm-hmm. handling of incoming herpes DNA. We think AAV again, um, and and one of the things we're pushing that we believe is true is that even transfected DNAs uh, right. are, no matter how they're transfected, whether they're microinjected or put in by calcium phosphate or DA dextran mm-hmm. or whatever, um, are all subject to this silencing. Uh, and in fact, 
uh, it's been known for quite a while that drugs like TSA um, mm-hmm. will dramatically stimulate the level of expression from transfected DNAs. So you said that recently at a faculty meeting. If yeah. you want to get high level of transfection expression, you just put one of these, you put TSA in. Yeah, it will It will often, depending on the cell and yeah. circumstance, Amazing. And the promoter have a very, very big effect on the level of expression. And so viruses obviously have to somehow counter this, like herpes viruses and others, otherwise they get silenced, right? Yeah, and I, I think we don't know yet the range of ways that yeah. viruses can do that. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And so the, the other thing I was thinking of, I guess this is a defense of the cell against any DNA coming in and yeah. doing things that they shouldn't be, right? Right. However, we know that horizontal gene transfer is beneficial or can be. Right, so I, I guess a bad gene could come in, or a good gene that could help you survive. So, I mean, how do how do you balance that? Right, I think most of the time, incoming DNAs are bad. <laughs> okay. So I yeah. think I think most of the time, the cell That's wants bad. to try to suppress incoming DNAs. Yeah. Well, I think actually mm-hmm. this this system um, kind of provides an interesting evolutionary concept where the virus integrates and gets its genes expressed after integrating. Yes, right. That's. I mean, that's so a very that, important point. That after integration, the silencing machinery that that we that we now know about goes away. So that so, could be interpreted as the retrovirus's answer to yeah, this sure. histone defense right. system. Totally. Right. Um, totally. Their DNA gets into the nucleus. They they've dealt with this problem by integrating their DNA. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I think you mentioned in this paper that herpes uses a viral protein, ICP zero, yep. to try and reverse the silencing. Right. Yep. Yeah, so integration is a cool strategy. Yeah. That's pretty neat. Yeah, it's like we're going to now just look like a cellular gene right. and sneak in in that way. So you know Pogo's famous saying, right? We have yeah, met yeah. the enemy and they is us. Yeah, right. And that's he what is this us. is. Right. He is us. He is, he is us. Right. Okay. We have met the enemy and they are we us. Are, oh, what? Is... <laughs> <laughs> we could look this up, actually. <laughs> okay, we get the idea, yeah. Well, yeah. that's always the case. Right. Hiding, and they are ours. Hiding in plain sight. So this right. is a this oh, see, silencing yes. of incoming DNA is, is, a, is a defense. Mm-hmm. Now just it's something that I just thought of now. What about incoming RNA? Oh. Do we do do cells do anything to that? So the the incoming retroviral RNA is not typically translated yeah. very efficiently, and um, we don't know why that might be. Except I think the usual answer again would be that it's it's sequestered, you know, still within a particle yeah, and it's, yeah. it's busy being reverse transcribed. Um, there is a, there is a, 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 a body of work that says there is some expression. Um, it's low. Uh, and mm-hmm. so there are probably some particles that fall apart and allow for translation um, without reverse transcription, Yeah, but it's low. Okay. Steve, is the double-stranded RNA absolutely necessary? Can you create a retrovirus with only one strand of RNA? <laughs> so, first of all, it's not double-stranded. So these I mean, two copies these are the two same. Copies are not paired. They're they're mm-hmm. folded into a particle. They are held together loosely at the five prime end by interesting uh, pairings, but they're basically single-stranded. Uh, and the answer is no. We we don't know of a way. Uh, to engineer or by which normally uh, single monomeric RNAs are packaged. Mm-hmm. And the part of that is that the, the signal, the packaging signal, is uh, a complex structure that <laughs> requires two molecules to form. Yeah. So there's and a, if you if you inject the RNA with a reverse transcriptase, that's not enough to get the process going. Right. That unfortunately doesn't work. So the, mm-hmm. the reverse okay. transcription requires... Okay the mm-hmm. entry into the cell of a particle and the reverse transcription has mm-hmm. to take place within that structure, mm-hmm. within that particle. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on that probably makes sense to require that particle. A lot of these jumps of sequences uh, and things have to be kept in a tight concentration to work well. Mm-hmm. So retroviral RNA, purified RNA is not infectious. Well, uh, you can transfect uh these these are all incredibly inefficient Mm -hmm. you can transfect uh dna and rna that will be expressed at some level and Mm -hmm. if you get enough expression to build a particle you you can start an infection so it it can be done but it's uh the most efficient thing is to transfect like proviral dna 
let it right. let it integrate or or okay. express badly okay. and and make enough. Right. And it's product. it's easy to imagine that the reverse transcriptase, which is not very processive, if it fell off the molecule and was just floating around in the cytoplasm, it would just get diluted out. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. right. And the jumps wouldn't work well. Jump, and, right. And but a lot if, of things. If you somehow work. engineered RNA to be produced at high level in a cell, it could give rise to enough components to make particles. Sure, because that, I mean, very high level expression from a provirus is how the late yeah. stages work. Right. You make right. gag, you make gag paul, and you make envelope. Those are the three products. Those will in. build a particle right. and they'll right. release it and they'll, they won't infect that cell likely, right. but they'll go right. on and infect so, a neighboring cell. So you don't, you don't need reverse transcription to mature a particle. You just need it to start the infection basically. Yeah, I mean, the incoming particle has RT in it. Yeah. yeah of course, yeah. that was the important realization that yeah. that mm. that the enzyme was prepackaged. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. Um, yeah, retroviral infection uh, goes through all the early stages yeah. without yeah. any need for new gene expression. And that's, the, that's really important because that's the basis of the fact that you can use retroviral particles to deliver completely mm-hmm. non-viral genes like globin. Um, and all of the protein machinery needed to do reverse transcription and integration right. are pre-made in the particle, and they don't need to be expressed. So your vector can be made to only express, mm-hmm. say, globin or whatever your you your want. favorite yeah, gene. Whatever you want. Right. Now, let me ask you one other thing. You said as soon as these uh, linears and circular DNAs integrate, then they be expressed. But as you know, there are some cells where they're integrated and silenced as well. Is this a good time to talk about that or should we? Absolutely. So that's the other, in fact, earlier setting where we've mm-hmm. studied silencing. And what you're referring to is the fact that embryonic stem cells, especially, mm-hmm. um, but many primitive, developmentally primitive cells, um, hematopoietic stem cells are probably the most studied example, um, will silence the integrated provirus very mm-hmm. strongly. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a real annoyance to the gene therapy people early on, <laughs> mm-hmm. because they were trying to deliver genes to hematopoietic stem cells, oh. and they kept getting silenced. Mm-hmm. It's amazing so. how many discoveries in science stemmed from somebody being really ticked off. <laughs> That's right. Stemmed. <laughs> he did yeah. use that word, yes. didn't he? He can't help it. <laughs> right. So, uh, so we were curious long before looking at this unintegrated situation okay. for what might have been involved in that silencing. And it was interesting that it's a completely, not completely, but it's a very different Mm -hmm. machinery. um, And it involves stem cell-specific factors that are working to silence integrated proviruses in in those cells. And they work at the promoter of the integrated provirus, right? Right. So there are are at least two and and probably three uh, layers to this silencing that Mm -hmm. we know about. The most potent one was known... First, I guess, by uh, maybe Rudy Anish and Eric Barkless in the, mm-hmm. gee, I don't know, 80s, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and they showed that the main target of that silencing was a little sequence in the proviral DNA that's called the primer binding site. Um, and they knew that there was a factor in the nucleus of embryonic cells that somehow recognized that and mediated the silencing. And, mm-hmm. and It basically blocks... Expression, transcription. Bug polymerase from initiating or something. Right. And this has nothing to do with hush. Correct. No, it's a different, as you said, it's a different system. But, and what's the function? What, why, for what purpose is the retrovirus silenced in a stem cell? Yeah. I mean, I, I think of it as, again, another antiviral mm. mechanism. Um, it's that, that, that fact is a little complicated by the fact that a lot of retroviral promoters uh, that make up our genome. Uh, actually, some of them perform now useful functions. Mm-hmm. So um, the the regulation be who you yeah, exactly. So the 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 range of uh, viral promoters that are littered around our genome mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. are handled in different ways. Many are silenced, but uh, they're not simply silenced. And in the course of development, there's a very complex pattern of turning on and off right. different right. of these promoters. And can you turn them on experimentally? 
Um, yes, to some extent, you can fiddle with them um, with drugs and uh, you can knock down some of these factors that yep. are blocking, right? Yep. And it's usually a bad thing to do that because <laughs> other things turn on as well. Yeah, right? inappropriate things happen I see. pretty often. Okay, right? got it. All right. That, yeah, I mean, that was also Gary Wong's work. Started way before him, but I remember from his thesis project. Actually, Dan Wolf was Dan the guy. Dan Wolf was the first guy to do yeah, it. Yeah, who really he, did it. He purified Trim 28, was it? Yep. So he purified this complex that Rudy Anish had detected, uh -huh. um, just biochemically, literally. Um, and then, you know, mass spec in the end allowed us to show that that complex mm -hmm. contained, yes, Trim 28. In other products. Also known as CAP1. And then subsequently the, the key DNA binding factor, which is a zinc finger protein. So I remember all this because I've listened. I have listened over the years to his fellows and students, and him giving. And I've Vincent. since his virology, I'm interested. You didn't just listen; you remembered. <laughs> I remember. And well, you integrated. <laughs> I'm I integrated. I'm in so many of his uh, committees that. Uh, but Gary in particular, <laughs> Gary in particular, I remember. <laughs> um, Dan Wolf used to give very nice talks about this, um, and it was really. And I used to see him standing outside the cold room looking at. Things drip, fractions dripping and stuff like that. That's, On the floor and things, yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, really cool. So that then you got interested in this this silencing on um, an entry of the of the unintegrated. And that's what the second paper really is, this one that just came out. December 2018. And so I, here you're looking at exactly how this happened. How it happened. Yeah, right. we're trying to identify the, the cellular genes that, that are responsible for mediating this silencing. And and we did it with a screen, which is the sort of the current uh, cool, I think, method, the CRISPR-based screen. Um, and so mm -hmm. you can describe that. Yeah, it, go ahead. It, it basically involves setting up a reporter assay that will allow you to score for the successful silencing or the lack of silencing. And we do that with a reporter retrovirus that expresses, you can do it with lots of things, GFP, for mm -hmm. example. Something you can assay easily, yep. right? And then you introduce into the cells that are that are being infected and that are manifesting silencing um, a library of knockout constructs. And the cool thing is CRISPR now allows you to do that very efficiently. Um, and there exist um, essentially complete knockout libraries delivered on on sort of uh, uh, on retroviral vectors. In fact, mm. um, the silencing uh, enzymes and guide RNAs. So that each cell has had a knockout of one gene. Amazing. And then you can screen <laughs> tens of thousands of cells for which Speak of glass. them might have turned on yeah. this this silent gene. So, so without the knockout, you you have a low level of right. Everybody's green. silent. You have the rare guys that now turn green. And, and you do this right. And you use integrase deficient, so you keep them from integrating, which right. would give you lots of green. Right. Right. Exactly. And, and you can automate this process. Yeah, yeah. Well, you you fact yeah. sort them out. You, know? you could you could automate it by a postdoc, right? <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> right, right. And we we can act. The nice thing here is that you can do it more than once, because if you do it once, you sort, you get the bright guys. Now, if you simply carry those for a bit, the viral DNA will go away. The unintegrated DNA will go away. Uh -huh. Cells grow, uh -huh. and now you can just repeat the whole process again, and keep enriching for the guys that have the characteristics of being That's able perfect, to express. Right? Goes, yep. Yeah. Cause then you just have the cells with the gene knocked out. Right. And you can do, you can do it, it again. again. You could do it with multiple colors. That's another way you could do it, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it's very easy to do it with the same color because the color goes away. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> these guys. So these DNAs are just degraded eventually. Right? Yeah. They yeah. dilute out and disappear. Huh? So how many, how many different uh, genes are you looking at? Over 20,000? Yeah, the, the libraries that we use, they come from the Broad, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they, they have three or four guide RNAs for each gene. Mm -hmm. um, now they're up to 10, I think, maybe for each gene. And they, they tend to cover 10 or 20,000 genes, 10,000 genes. And this also includes Cas9, which will cut the sequence. Right. And then it will be repaired by the cell and repaired defectively, so this basically the gene is, is knocked out. And, and it's amazing to me. It's so efficient that you're hitting both alleles so, of, yeah, of every cool. gene. So you can do this in diploid cells, which is amazing. 
Yeah, and, yeah. And when you say ten to twenty thousand genes, you're twenty thousand genes. You're basically hitting the whole genome. You're, 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 yeah, it's I mean, gone. it's not per- <laughs> these libraries. Yeah, it's not all there is. No, and close. the libraries are not perfect, but you know they're pretty good. If you're hitting half of them, even that's that's fine. And so, in principle, you take your cell, and these are done in HeLa cells. They're HeLa Cas9 producing. You put your um, guide RNA library in, yep. and how long do you wait before all the cutting happens you and know, repairing? I, I think it's only a day or two. Wow. It's not long. <laughs> I'm yeah. thinking weeks, you know, you yeah. wait for all this. <laughs> thing to have. It's a few days, and then you put in your retrovirus with the reporter. Yep. And then you do the sort. And then and you, you get the brightest ones. Again. Yep. The best and the brightest. Yeah, right. exactly. And then you repeat. Because the brightest the ones are the ones that are... Have lost the silencing. Not, right, are not silenced. Right. right. Have, have lost exactly. the silencing most thoroughly. Right. Yeah. Now, I could imagine many ways to lose that besides the histones or histone modifications, right? And yeah. I, I mean, we were, when you do a screen like this, you're open-minded, hopefully, yeah. about whatever you get. Um, and they the, the screen is going to tell you what the most important pieces of machinery... Are that's that's what I love about screens is that yeah you know you you don't have to know what you're doing <laughs> so the, the, so the cell case, is going to tell you so you have <laughs> no you have to know what you did though <laughs> yeah, yeah. so you have you, a, a bunch you throw of the bait uh, it won't necessarily be a trout on the hook <laughs> so you have a number of cells which will now give you bright uh, GFP and they're all independent cell lines right so and how do but, you f- but we don't sort them out we I mean uh-huh. so the way you find out which genes yeah. you hit is essentially that it's it's sort of barcoded, but you basically PCR amplify the guide RNAs mm-hmm. that generated those. They're okay. present yeah. because they were delivered on a vector, so they're still there. Right. Um, and essentially, you're just sequencing the guide RNA. Um, and you look in the cells that were not bright, that were not selected to be bright, and the cells that were selected to be bright, mm-hmm. and you ask, okay, what of what's which gene guide RNAs have been enriched in yeah. those bright yeah. guys? And it was it was really we've done a lot of these screens mm-hmm. in a lot of filters with a lot of selections, and this one was just wonderfully clean, mm-hmm. in that there were just uh, I think five really standout genes that were extremely enriched. It's r- rare that you get such a clean, yeah. Um, and they're genes that well, make sense. Yes, that's the other miracle. That, that must have been incredibly <laughs> rewarding, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's like wow, three of them were a known complex the hush mm-hmm. complex mm-hmm. which has made perfect sense yeah i mean the, it, our earlier identification by biochemistry of factors at that pbs site that dan wolf did were was also satisfying because it made sense it was trim 28 which was a known repressor and a zinc finger protein and and that too was satisfying but for these genetic screens to turn up a cluster of genes that all make sense is also well, but really Dan nice. had to pure, Dan yeah. had to purify yeah. the protein and do mass spec. Yep, and took years, yep. right? Yep. Whereas here, you, you pulled out five in a couple of weeks, right? Well, I, I e Ping would say it took a little longer than that. <laughs> <laughs> it was the elevator. I'm going to go do this screen. <laughs> yeah, right. it was a year or two, but yeah, it was it was not. So, you, five, what are the five? Tell us. It must be NP220, which is in the title. Right? Yes. Yes. So that was the new protein, not previously uh-huh. known to be a part of any of this. But it had and a it name, right? Yeah, it had been, uh, you know, identified as a DNA binding protein of mm-hmm. essentially no known function. I presume NP means nuclear protein. Yeah, I believe that's yeah. correct. Okay. Um, the three components of Hush, uh, Taser, MPP8, and peripheralin. Um, and they had a only very recent history in silencing in a mm-hmm. different setting we'll talk about. Um, and then I think the other one was set DB1, maybe. Is that right? That's yeah, right. Yep. Yep. That, that's and, right. And by the way, the, the Hush Complex is also on TWIV 516 for people who want to right. rewind a little bit. Yeah, so that was Jeremy Luban's Jeremy last. Luban. And then before him, we had Ned Landau, who's also, he hinted at Hush. Mm-hmm. He talked about. <laughs> he whispered about really it. He whispered. <laughs> he whispered about us. Right. Uh, and then Jeremy talked about it in the context of HIV. Right. And then the line from he night. said, "But you know, Steve's <laughs> lab is also doing some hush." And I said, "Okay, well, when the paper's published, and so that's and he's ready to talk about hush." <laughs> well, they didn't rush. To Here talk we are. About hush. Sorry. So these five proteins. What do you do next with these five proteins? Steve? So, so we essentially, as in any screen, you go back and validate that these are true players. So today, fortunately, that's really easy. You can knock them out one by one mm-hmm. um, and ask what the consequences are 
for the virus. Right. Um, and it was, it was very clear knocking out any of these um, gave you a cell that now failed to silence the incoming DNA okay. in the way that a wild type cell would. So all this machinery was, was required, mm-hmm. all five of them. Um, and our next question is, well, how are these arranged and, and who's actually binding directly to the DNA? Um, and we could, we could do that because we could assay for that by chip again, by mm-hmm. chromatin IP. Um, and the bottom line was all of these guys in a wild type cell were in fact bound to the incoming DNA. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we could knock out each one and ask what happens to the remaining ones. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And that allowed us to see that NP220 was the key DNA binding guy. When you knocked it out, mm-hmm. everything went away. The other four, don't everybody was gone. And when you, when you knocked out some of the others, NP220 remained. I see. Okay. So NP220 was the guy directly binding to the DNA. So it looks like NP220 binds the DNA, the rest of this complex assembles around it. Correct. So the, you said it was a DNA bind, it has a DNA binding domain and a zinc finger. Yeah, which was uh, interesting, but not a DNA binding zinc finger. I see. Um, it's it's a protein binding so zinc finger. It's, it's important for interacting with the other components. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So and, you say, and there's not much known uh, yet about its DNA binding specificity. Mm-hmm. Um, unlike the zinc finger guys that that bind in embryonic stem cells which bind to a very specific sequence. Um, that's a more mm-hmm. classical zinc finger guy. This one only has very loose specificity for polypyrimidine stretches. It loves poly C right. stretches. Um, and it, it probably binds you know, pretty widely to lots of incoming DNAs. It's not got a very tight, um, you know, highly specific specificity. So even transfected DNA might be recognized yeah. by... Yeah, most promoters, when you look at them, um, will have what seem to be, you know, two or three uh, mm-hmm. canonical binding sites for NP220. So this seems like a pretty good candidate for a general DNA defense yeah. mechanism. Yeah, mm-hmm. I agree. So we, we validated this this these putative sites by making mutants of the virus that lack these sites. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. indeed, they now escape much of the silencing. These are sites in the LTR, right? Yeah. Correct. So you think it's binding LTR regions mainly, yeah? Yeah. I mean, when you look down the whole genome, there are more potential binding sites. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think those could also contribute. But uh, if you mutate, you know, the three or five most prominent ones near the promoter, they seem to have a pretty big effect. Right. Those, are, those deletions right. don't have as strong an effect as knocking out the entire protein, but they have pretty good effects. So those are... Okay. Those are seemingly the more important sites. And you say you found se- binding sequences in HIV as well. Indeed, right. And in, and it basically is handled, in, as far as we know, in the same way. It's not quite as strongly suppressed, um, but, pretty, but, but otherwise pretty much So HIV same. coming in, the same idea. same idea. Circles and linears, unintegrated, they're silenced. Yep. Same have you done thing. that or have others? Yeah, no, yeah. We, others have done that too. Okay. And. ALV was interesting in that it's not as responsive to knockout of NP220, mm. and it has very few of these sites. So whether it was right. evolved for that, I cannot say. Mm-hmm. But not every virus has these sites. Steve, does any of this work relate to trying to rid a patient of the last remnant of HIV infection after the triple treatment? I don't think it will help remove or get rid of the reservoir. Mm. Um, I think there's there's some effort being made not to necessarily get rid of the reservoir, but to at least deal with Alter its it. expression. Yeah, and and there are two ways. There's the shock and kill idea, which is to try to activate everybody yeah, sure. and then kill them. Right. And then there's the suppress, just to keep them silent forever and leave them there. So that right. neither one works. <laughs> neither one works. <laughs> right. So I guess the, the question is, is this involved in silencing HIV in the latent reservoir? So we don't really know. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a lot of people working on that is silencing. Is involved in that? Um, you know, people have started this. to look at knockdown of different factors. Yeah. yeah. Um, Jonathan Karn has his own favorite um, histone modification that he mm-hmm. thinks is really important. <laughs> Um, My favorite histone modification. Yeah, yeah. Easy H2 is, is his favorite okay. factor. 
So I think there may be different modifications uh, and different uh, machineries in different settings, but that yeah, those those yeah. cells are are very hard to study because they're rare. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, you said you tried a few different retroviruses, and Rouse yes. was different. Yep. So, if you did the screen with Rouse, you'd presumably pick yep. up some other, right? Uh, something related to NP two twenty that binds the D- the DNA, and right. So, it would, I, be, it would I, be interesting to do, right? Right. So, Eping is is sure that there will be more DNA binding proteins to be found that will tether Hush, mm-hmm. and he's he'd like to do that when he starts his own lab. Yeah, That'd I mean, I great. Could, and there, are, um, so. Obviously, the viruses have a pressure to get around this. Other than integrating, um, they could get rid of the poly C tract, but obviously that doesn't give Rouse free reign. So there's something else that the that the cell came up with in response to that strategy. Sure, sure. You know, and and it's not like any of these uh, repressors of virus are perfectly effective since obviously right. the virus is surviving it get through <laughs> yeah it's doing yeah. okay but yeah. hiv uses vpr to get around hush is that right uh yeah that's a that's a potent uh mm. suppressor that's of what hush. that's what that's, jeremy talked about yep. if i remember right. correctly yeah. right so that's one way of getting around it yeah the hush complex it's worth noting it was originally discovered because of its silencing of proviral dnas that have gone into heterochromatin Mm-hmm. So in permissive cells, when you do an infection, you know, many of the integrations go into open chromatin and they're expressed and that's that's how things normally work. Mm-hmm. But many proviruses go happen to go into heterochromatin and they are silenced and they are silenced by hush. So that mm-hmm. was the work of Peter of uh, Paul Lerner who who discovered hush in that context. I see. So it just ran because it's random. Sometimes you will get into silenced. Yeah, and the hush is, is needed to keep them silent. So he actually hmm. infected cells, took the non-expressors of, of from permissive cells, and then right. looked at what keeps them silent. And hush was hush. what did that. Right. Yeah. Cool. That's very neat. Um, right. Um, I actually, you gotta unfortunately, go. I have to go. Okay. Um, but uh, I will go ahead and throw out my, my pick at this point, okay. which was a listener pick a few weeks ago. It's The Tangled Tree by David Quammen. Right. Um, and I know it was a recent listener pick, but and that's actually one of the th- reasons that I picked it up and <laughs> read it. Just finished it. It's a great book. Um, you know, I, I obviously I knew a lot of the science behind it already, but reading about the personalities behind these discoveries is just just a lot of fun and <laughs> a really good story. Um, that's so about definitely. That's about is, horizontal transmission. Yeah, of well, yeah. In, in it part. ends up with that. Yeah, <laughs> That's right. It, start, yeah. it starts with uh, yeah. with uh, um, Linnaeus and goes through uh, Carl Woese and then horizontal gene transfer and yep. all the territory in between and, and just a lot of fun. Yeah. That all right. Cool. Thank you, Alan. Enjoy. All right. And Steve, good talking to you again. Yeah. Uh, take care. Bye bye. Yep. See you all around. Right. Bye. And uh, of course, we had David Quammen on. Tuivo a couple of weeks ago. Um, some of the other um, components besides NP220, what do they do? Do you know? So we don't really know very much. MPP8 is one of the hush complexes where there's a little bit known. It, mm-hmm. it, it clearly binds some of the modified histones. So it's probably, you know, part of the glue that's, uh-huh. that's holding the complex down once it's been marked there, placed there by other DNA binding proteins. Um, but yeah, I don't think we know, you know, enzymatic functions for most of them. You said MPP8 is, uh, binds H3K9. Correct. Right. Hmm. Hike. There's a, it's kind of an analogy in that other complex that we have is HP1. HP1 is a similar, uh, modified histone binder mm-hmm. that probably helps tack down the cap one complex in that setting. And so set, that, that's and, a theme and, there. And set B1 is a histone methyl transferase that makes the Mark. H3K9 marks. Correct. Right. So the general idea here is that uh, NP220 is binding the DNA, it recruits these other, and they they silence the chromatin. They, they, they place, they are the writers that then place all the marks on the histones that do actually do the silencing. But they don't bring in the histones themselves. Correct. So that's a next really right. interesting question is who's loading the histones? Mm-hmm. 
and what are the histone loaders for this right. new DNA? So I have and, a question. And, and we're very keen wait, wait, to... No, 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 no. You, I'm just going to finish to say that we're very hot on that right now. Right. So as you said earlier, Dixon, is there a pool of histones? Yeah. But so in the cell, as the, the DNA is dividing, histones are coming off and going on, right? Right. So there are two classes of loaders that are known. Mm -hmm. There are the replication-dependent loaders that put on nucleosomes behind the fork. Right. So, of course, when a fork, DNA replication fork moves mm -hmm. down the DNA, you've, you've got, you know, the need to double the number of nucleosomes. Right. Um, and so, the, there's some issues of how the nucleosomes are displaced and reloaded uh, behind the fork. Right. right. Um, so, you have to displace them to replicate. Right. You got to move it through and then they've got to rebind behind the fork. Wow. <laughs> um, but you've got to make new ones that bind too. Yeah. And there's a whole category of histone loaders that are replication dependent that do that work. So those are very interesting mm -hmm. loaders. Mm -hmm. Now you probably wouldn't think those would be involved here because the retroviral DNAs don't have replication forks right. moving through them. They're not replicating in the in any normal way. They're just delivered as DNAs. They don't replicate. So that machinery may not be involved, although we don't know. Then there's another mm -hmm. whole class mm -hmm. of histone loaders that are not replication dependent, but they're more involved in in loading and unloading histones in response to things like regulatory transcriptional events, repair, uh, and maybe those mm -hmm. are the guys that would be more likely to be doing this loading. But when you think about it, transfected DNAs or retroviral DNAs are really unusual in that they're mm -hmm. naked. I mean, they've never had histones on them. So the cell is confronted with DNA that it's that's never seen histones yeah, before. Yeah, yeah. So it's going to be an unusual circumstance mm -hmm. where the cell is trying to load histones onto them. Well, that that brings up the question how often do cells get DNA exogenously, right? Yeah. I mean, we're led to think that DNA is moving all over the place, not just in viruses and plasmids, but naked DNA, right? As cells break, the DNA floats around. So maybe do we have any sense for how often DNA enters cells. I don't know. I mean, I would think rarely. Yeah. You know, there are people who are looking in mm. things like plasma, blood, yeah. and yeah. and seeing that there's a lot of DNA floating around loose yeah. that's from presumably dead cells, yeah, sure. apoptotic cells. But yeah. do those DNAs get taken up and used? I don't know. I don't know. So to get into the nucleus, though, is another step, right? I could see them yeah. being taken up by endocytosis, but then... Yeah. What's going to bring them in the nucleus? Yeah. And I, then is there a continuous synthesis of histones that would be available for this then? Yeah. Do, I mean, cells true? that are metabolically active are making histones. Yeah. If they're okay. dividing, they're making a lot of histones. Mm -hmm. um, if they're Even if they're not dividing, though, they make some because there's some need for them for repair and, and other things. So Did, there, you, there's a, did you want to say something? Well, I, I wanted to ask about an evolutionary trend here. These are lots of circles and squares and <laughs> <laughs> rectangles. <laughs> how many are kept or how far back can you go with regards to the phylogenetic tree of eukaryotes and still find the system? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so that's been looked at for hush. I can't, I don't fully remember the answer. We didn't do it. No. I think Paul did. Um, and NP220, I know, I think we've looked very casually so these these things go back, you know, mammals, birds, but not not Reptiles. not incredibly far. No. I don't fish. Yeah, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah. So uh, I have a question related to um, transposons. So when DNAs jump around the genome, yeah. so they're they're in the genome, they are chromatinized, then they're copied, and when they come out, are they immediately coded as well? Well, so so now you you have to. Think about so there. We're talking about two classes. Yeah. There's the DNA there's the RNA. cut and paste yeah. DNA <laughs> transposons, and then there's the retro transposons, which go through RNA. RNA. Okay. So, so the retro guys are just being transcribed. So they're not the the DNA is never excising. They're just making transcripts that reverse transcribe and reintegrate. But when they just reverse like transcribe, the they get coded. Yes, with histones, right? right. And we just we haven't looked at line yeah. uh, elements. Presumably, lots of retro elements Got it. Um, do undergo those events. Uh, the cut and paste guys, I don't you know. Is, 
I don't know the answer. Do you know mm -mm. if those mm -mm. are uh, they're presumably cut out? I bet with with histones, histones already there. Maybe yeah. and and they may hop with histones. Yeah, because you say here in the paper that NP two twenty. Well, you say hush has is a role in um, silencing evolutionarily young retrotransposons. Right. So that's that's. Uh, a topic we just heard about in some seminars recently, that there seems to be selective uh, higher levels of, of activity on evolutionarily young ones. And I don't know if that's um, because they're more active. Uh, yeah, they're or, less degraded. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or whether they've just not degraded as much yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's pretty cool. Kathy, you still there? Yeah. Yes, I wanted to ask a little more. You mentioned the HIV but you looked at a couple other retroviruses, and yeah. I don't think we talked about that. Yeah, we, we looked at avian, um, and they, as I say, weren't as silenced. Um, they don't, they, so some of these knockouts didn't have big consequences on the levels of expression of unintegrated DNAs. So, I, you know, I think not all, virus, all retroviruses are the same. Uh, I don't think they're all going to be silenced exactly by the same machinery. Um, so there will, I guess what I was wondering is if yep. you think there's like different hushes or different components of hushes or, yeah, I think those are all still on the table. Mm -hmm. I think, I think at least they're going to have different DNA binding, uh, components. I think they may not all need all the hush components. There's mm -hmm. certainly evidence that's that MPP eight can work independently of the others, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, I think many, maybe set DB1 will be one of the very common features, um, but uh, you know that remains to be seen. I think that's that's going to be an interesting uh, issue whether we can there'll, there'll be classes of these silencing machineries that are distinctive for different viruses. And and we we are doing this in in putatively permissive cells, but I think there may well be cell differences as well. So do you think there are? Well, if you take out NP220, do you think that would be de detrimental to an organism? So, Cells are okay, right? So the the knockout uh, mice have just been implanted. Ah. So mm. I'll let you I'll let you know in a few months. <laughs> okay. I, I and I I I don't have a good prediction. It could be embryonic lethal. Yeah. End of yeah. story, or it could be that there'll be no phenotype whatsoever. <laughs> So I am well, I am dying to know. I mean, Maybe so, their squeaks get louder. So it could be lethal <laughs> if um, if other things are not silenced that should be. That's right. At different times, because I mean, this mm -hmm. could go beyond preventing against DNA coming in, or it could just be important during an infection. So you have to infect them. Right. Can you challenge them with Maloney? We will yeah. do that. That's yeah. exactly the plan. Mm -hmm. yep. And and you know, there's a history for the other system. So the Trim Twenty Eight Zinc Finger story mm -hmm. um, is kind of our you know, touchstone, I guess. So when you knock out trim 28, that's embryonic lethal and you get, right. you get massive induction of, of the endogenous, endogenous retroviruses, retroviruses and lots of other mm -hmm. things I might add that are bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whereas knockout of ZFP 809, which is the guy, the zinc finger, that's one of the 400 zinc finger proteins that, mm. that trim 28 is targeted with. Um, has much more subtle effects because now you're only affecting a subset, the, right. the very small subset yeah, that yeah, have a yeah. proline PBS, yeah. and um, and those those have phenotypes. There's bad things, but it's not lethal. So is MP220 part of a big family of related proteins, or it is? So it, is. it, it well, in a very loose way, it has motifs that are present elsewhere. Mm -hmm. It has these matron motifs, but you wouldn't. If it if it were not for those motifs, you wouldn't see it as a family, right? Right. Um, so it's otherwise it's a very big protein with with conserved motifs. So and this is this is Maloney in HeLa cells, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so it's a human NP two twenty. I presume there's a mouse. You're knocking it out, right? Yeah, so there is yes, a mouse, yeah. and they're very similar. Yes, they're very similar. So do in in humans are there any mutations that Localized to two twenty. No, I don't you, think so. You've looked. I, yeah. I don't. I don't think so. Yeah. Okay, that would have been cool, right? To see that. Um, and and you said before in answer to Dixon's question that it goes back a certain way evolutionarily, but not too far to back. Birds, but not. Far. Yeah, I, I. You know, I. I should ask Yi Ping how far he looked. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, the, the other thing I wanted to ask you, so so HIV uses VPR and X to inactivate HUSH. The, does Maloney inactivate it in any way? Not that we know. No, yeah. there's no equivalent to that machinery. It no, just it's, integrates. It, yeah. It's interesting. HIV has evolved all, acquired all these auxiliary factors whose main function seems to be to inactivate restriction factors. Uh, mm-hmm. And Maloney just lives with them. Um and, and does pretty well. Although, you know, it has some ability to remove some of the restriction factors. Um, the glycogag does that. But yeah. but most of the time, it just mm. somehow endures them, I guess. I'm trying to understand what what's the significance of hush in Maloney, because these are unintegrated forms, which, as you said, don't have any contribution to infection. Once the provirus integrates... It's no longer subject to NP220. That's right. And I, so I think it's it's right, fair to say that the consequence is, is limited to that window of time mm-hmm. when uh, you would potentially otherwise have ex- early expression. Um, so that could and, be detrimental. And, and, yeah. And so we did, uh, therefore, look at the bulk replication of wild-type spreading virus mm. uh, in the setting of knockout, and the virus spreads faster. So okay. it has it has effects, and we did it for both Maloney and HIV. Um, so it's it's not an all or nothing yeah. thing. It's in the paper, but you see a faster yeah, replication yeah. when you knock it out. So it has there's that you know being able to express in that day in that window of, di- yeah. of time um, allows replication to go faster. But if you if you infect a NP two twenty knockout, you the, the the absence of silencing of the circles and linears doesn't really make the virus more pathogenic or anything, right? Yeah, we don't know that. I mean, I guess that's what the mouse experiment yeah, will tell yeah. us. When we infect guess, them yeah. with Maloney, we'll find out. <laughs> so tell us what happens when you infect a mouse. Do most mice have Maloney to begin with? Or Well, they have you know, hundreds of endogenous copies of, Maloney, of, right. of Maloney-like elements. Right. Um, a few mice um, have have you know, functional copies uh-huh. uh, of, of MLV like sequences. And those are the typical, those were actually originally developed as uh, mice that, that people didn't know why spontaneously had high leukemia incidents. And what they are is strains of mice that acquire, you know, functional virus that are mm. usually activated at birth roughly. Uh, so the mice are born viremic. Mm-hmm. And they get leukemia a few months later, um, so you can you can acquire by birth by your genetics uh, the seeds of leukemia. And these are wild mice, right? Yeah. Well, they're some of the strains in labs also had. had they were all like all lab mice. Yes, derived ultimately from wild mice. So, there, is there any uh, mouse horizontal transmission besides the? At birth. Sure. Mouse to mouse. Mouse to mouse. Sure. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, you know, lots and lots of the mice on the street are leukemic <laughs> uh, and are viremic. And the most of that spread is is probably horizontal. Okay. So, so uh, it's very easy to inoculate mice with Maloney virus or any other, and they'll, they'll get leukemia. As a rule, you have to infect newborns. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. the adults will usually control the infection well mm-hmm. enough that they won't ultimately get leukemia. So the fact is that the mice uh, need to be viremic for months, typically before leukemia really becomes apparent, and that's because you need you know hundreds millions of cells to be infected before the accidental insertion next to an oncogene mm-hmm. occurs, mm-hmm. which is the initiating event for the leukemia. Which oncogene is the one involved? So MYC is very common Mick. in Maloney, uh, but there's a whole slew of them, and they were named clever things like INT1, mm-hmm. you know, for integration site one. <laughs> yes, <laughs> some, yeah. I think that was possibly Barmus. Anyway, and some of those turn out, you know, many of them now have been renamed as their functions have right. become apparent, and most of them are in the signaling pathways that we now yeah. know and love that have to do with oncogenesis. So basically, your assay is going to be looking for leukemia, yeah. which you would take blood and you can see the proliferation of abnormal cells, right? Yeah. So we'll look, we'll look really first just for viremia mm. and the level of viremia and, yeah. then, and then the timing of appearance of leukemia, right? Yep. 
that's all assuming them there are mice to study. Yeah, if they live, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, if it's lethal, that's also interesting. Yeah. But harder to study. Yeah. You know, as long as you can get to uh, an early embryo stage, yeah, um, sure. we can study it. If they die at the eight cell stage, there's something. <laughs> then it's then it's technically challenging. So you said some lab strains have Maloney in them already. Yeah, not not part not Maloney per se, but related but murine leukemia viruses. Yes, and they're making particles. Yes. as well. Yes, and that, so and can those, you give an example of one of those strain ooh, names? Um, <laughs> No, I'm just I can't. Curious. I okay. can't. I can't. You'll you'll okay. need to talk to John Coffin and uh, Jonathan okay. Stoy to to get their names. Okay. Um. Yeah. There's a there's a story of some of those mice uh, being bred at Jackson Labs having one known uh, locus for one of these replication competent um, viruses, and then over the and they they breed them and sell you know hundreds of thousands of these mice. And then after some years, a second copy appeared. Hmm. So this was some of the best data on the frequency of spontaneous reacquisition of new inserted copies mm-hmm. of a copy in a viremic animal. Right. So it's it's it was you know one event in ten years in hundred thousand mice of breeding or something. So, so it's rare. Endo- it became endogenized again a Correct. second time. Correct. Uh, yeah, that's cool. Okay, I found a couple. Just, Give us some names. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> not C well, not C fifty seven black. Or, actually, these are friend no. leukemia. Um, C three H. No, I no, 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 no. So. They're they're things that have lots of letters and superscripts <laughs> and stuff after them. Yeah, yeah. Most of the uh, here's one like um, Mav one oh one one. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Okay. Mav one oh one Maloney leukemia virus ten like. Okay, mm. that's yeah. that. So so yeah. last week. Kathy's pick was a paper showing that inbred mice are no less genetically variable than outbred mice. Right, Kathy? Is that the mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A okay. statistical analysis? Okay. So we don't, and since outbreds breed better and give you bigger litters and so forth, we should be using them. <laughs> yeah. When when you can, when you don't need to have the, yeah. you know, if you're not using transgenic mice or those kinds of things. Yeah, and but, I guess, yeah. and I guess geneticists like the fully homozygous, clean, inbred. They do for various things, but but they're not as n- invariable as you think. Right, that's the point. And right. the rest, right. results are totally inapplicable to the real world. Right. <laughs> so I'm looking at the methods here, and uh, the CRISPR knockout library is called Brunello. <laughs> yeah, they they all have names. They keep coming up with new well, libraries. Brunello is a wonderful wine, uh, right? <laughs> Brunello di Montalcini. <laughs> Someone was being funny. And I don't know if they're all wines or not. All the different <laughs> libraries that you can Yeah, so Ad get, Gene uh, is where you would, you would get these things. It's a just a clearance house for yeah. plasmids and libraries and so forth. It's a very good service by the way. Uh if you need things, um you could deposit your stuff. Oh, here's another one. Another library. It's called Brie. Brie. <laughs> the cheese. That goes yeah. well with the Brunello. <laughs> it goes with the Brunello. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That reminds me, you know the story of Bagel One, right? Gee, no, I don't think I do. Um, Talk about the enzyme. Or, or was it Cree Locks? Locks? <laughs> Cree Locks. Cream cheese and locks. Ah, cream. You know, the Cree Locks system was called be- cream cheese and locks. You got yeah. it. Oh, you got I it. never nice. knew that. Some, I thought you told me that. I don't think it was me, you know. Well, yeah. this CRISPR system needs a baguette now. <laughs> <laughs> but, but bagel one is a restriction enzyme, which no one called bagel except Dan Nathans, because I think he's originally from New York. Mm-hmm. And everyone else called it Biggle. And he would say, no, it's bagel, of course. <laughs> and I, the, the but bag- I assume that those are usually named for the species of bacteria. Yeah, bacteria. So I assume it was B. Something right. I don't know what yeah, I'm looking it up now. Yeah, I don't, it is um, you know, like E. coli R one is E. coli blah blah. Yeah, you know, in the old days you could easily find this. <laughs> um, where is the bacteria from Bagel One product? Them I'm at the New England BioLab site. In the old days, when I bought enzymes, they always had the, the bacteria there. Bio. New England BioLabs. One of the first. I have the hard copy of the catalog. I'm looking. Look it up. it up. Bagel One. Whoa. I'm gonna see. <laughs> These are all great mm-hmm. names. Oh, no, you have to go to the product page on the website. Well, the best names, we may, we purified a restriction enzyme from a, a bacterium 
there was a strap and it was it was supposed to be sac strap acro it's a, i think a chroma color but it turned out it was a different strain of of strap and the guy i purified it with was french and so he called and it, we decided to call it uh strep stanford it was at stanford and that was so he could call it sst1 because he liked the concord yeah <laughs> <laughs> a bagel one is bacillus globigi ah uh, there you go uh, so it was bacillus so it should be bagel well, that's it's, ba- it's actually right. bagel two mm. i don't know what bagel one is Bacil- yeah, yeah bagel well, probably the same, same thing, same right? thing yeah yeah, yeah. Zillis Globe Big Eye. Bagel, not Biggle. But if you're at if you weren't from New York, you would say Biggle. Um and Cree Lox is um cream cheese and lox is the Cree Lox, which we was before CRISPR, which you could use to target things, right? Is there anything else we missed in this paper that we should mention, Steve? No, I, I think, think we, we hit everything, right? We got the, the drift, right. I wanted to mention there is a, a news and views in the front of the same issue of nature by Paranaz. Ozuni and Melanie mm-hmm. Ott yes. has a diagram, but I bet Steve has his own diagram that he could give Vincent. It's a one. I'm looking at it. Well, that's yeah, one of the, the paper. Of course, figures like that are all in nature are always in supplementary material these days. <laughs> but right. the, the, that uh, extended data figure eight is our cartoon of uh, ah. of the complex. Which yeah. Yeah, cool cartoon. You'll have to, you'll have and to Dixon says again. there are lots of squares and circles. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's that's where I got annoyed because I couldn't download all the extended figures at once. I had to do them one at a time. Yeah. Hmm. So I didn't get up to eight. Yeah. I looked up the ones that I wanted to see the data on and yeah, I forgot about it. Figure eight extended. It's got the nice diagram of what they think is uh, mm-hmm. happening here. And you're going to keep working on this, right? We are. As I said, we're very interested in the, the loaders mm. um, of histones. And mm. we suspect, you know, we're not done. There are more factors yet. So is it just a matter found. of DNA? Histone sees it and says, ah, DNA and hits it? or is it No, worse? no. So loading is a more complicated <laughs> yeah. process. Um, yeah. And they, these, these are lo- large machines yeah. that, do yeah. the, that do the loading. I have to say in the old days, which is 20, 30 years ago, I thought histones were boring. Like yeah. you said, just yeah. this is how you wrap DNA to get it into a cell it's so long right but it's very interesting and you know what the moral is don't think anything is boring because it could Correct. be that you dig a little deeper remember what matisse said what did matisse say you see matisse said you should pay attention to everything because everything is all connected i think that's great it it's is. all connected it is when you see one of his paintings you'll realize what he meant i mean yeah. he, he painted patterns all they look conflicting but they're mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. and this this reminds me of the inside of an amazon a shipping warehouse. <laughs> You've got things going in all directions. You know, packages coming in, and so what, what monitors all this, Steve? There's got to be a, an oversight. What? Who's who's looking at all of this and saying, uh, "Ah, you put that box in the wrong place." Jim, you right, Jim you're anthropomorphizing. You're right. fired. <laughs> yeah, but I think there are signals that are recognized on uh, on incoming things, and I mean, we certainly know about uh, you know the systems that rec- like Rig I and MDA five that recognize odd RNA structures as foreign. So I think this is, you know, an analogy of that for DNA. Um, so I think, I think there's, there's recognition of proteins, recognitions of all it's kinds of system. incoming stuff as amazing. foreign. And it's, it's just the primitive immune system before it's quite amazing. you have antibodies. This is the innate immune system. It's all because of parasites, Dixon. It is. If we didn't have parasites, it we wouldn't is. eat any of this stuff. It would be overrun with life It would be forms. less complicated. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. I think we should just build a wall around the nucleus. <laughs> but then things couldn't get out and that's, in normally. See, that's uh, the know, problem. That's right. Well, one of them can't. It needs the, the nuclear envelope to disappear before it can go. Yeah, yeah. That's absolutely right. Which happens, right, when cells divide so that... That's it's amazing. evolved to take advantage. It's just quite, remarkable. Quite amazing. It's all, it's all remarkable. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask something else, but now I have lost it. What were you just talk, we talking about? Histones and marking. Oh, here it is. So I think this is the one thing that you have worked on your whole years here. Because <laughs> last time we we talked about XMRV the first time, and that's gone. And then the, the steamer, the clam cancers, that's gone. But this, you've always, is that, is that correct to say that? Or well, what? I guess you could say this is the current. Uh, you know, area where we've looked for host factors. That would be the the theme yeah. that we've always been interested in 
cellular proteins that have impact on virus. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So, but um, so silencing is a recent interest. Yeah, I mean, it, I guess it started with the desire to understand that primer binding site silencing, and then the the unintegrated DNA silencing. But but these were just two steps in the life cycle that we knew were important. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, a lot of our screens pick up factors that work on the way in, in trafficking or on the way out at Virion Assembly. And we're interested in those too. So we're, you know, another story Yiping himself here worked on was that meristate story where mm-hmm. the gag proteins and terminal meristate is recognized. Um, and, and regulated in its trafficking, so you know we're we're pretty uh, uh, unrestricted in our interest in restriction, <laughs> and any anything goes. So uh, Yi Ping, the first author, is going to start his own lab on this stuff, right? Yep. Yep. And we don't know where yet that will happen. Right. Gary Wong was a MD PhD student here. Right, correct. And he's back. Yep. Right. He's, he's doing a residency here. Yep. He's doing his MD. And I see him uh, running around the floor, so yep. he must be working in your lab again. Yeah. Right? He's he's working, you know, in between his clinical duties somehow. <laughs> so does he want and to be it, a clinical scientist one day? Is that I, I think he wants to, to be a, a basic scientist. Yeah. Um right. and physician so scientist. He's doing silencing work still in the lab? Yep. Yeah. Okay. He's still he's still got topics in the, related mm-hmm. to this that he's working on. And then Oya was a postdoc, right? Yep, who came to me from John Coffin. John Coffin. Yep. So listeners may remember Oya because with John, she figured out that XMRV was a recombinant retrovirus that was generated in mice. Really cool stuff. And what is she off to now? So she's in Berlin, mm-hmm. and she's um, working sort of as one of these super postdocs mm-hmm. positions, which she's now hoping will transit to a real independent position. Mm-hmm. Uh, on viruses so, or something else? Um, yes, she's 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 going to be working on uh, probably a range of viruses. I bet she's very interested in in uh, the interferon response, which is really what she worked on mostly in my lab. I, pr- pr- I, forgive me for exploring, but I know all these people, so I'm curious about where they are. You know, <laughs> it's not usually that I know all the authors on a paper. All right, um, I just want to make one more mention um i think last time i mentioned our twiv world tour t-shirts designed by sharon Isern, and she has now made them available for global purchase at amazon and zazzle so you can buy them all around the world mm. and uh, i will put a link to those in the show notes so um you can, some people complain that they couldn't buy them in certain countries, but now you can buy them everywhere. Mm-hmm. And let's do some picks. Alan gave us his pick, uh, The Tangled Tree. Dixon, what do you have for us today? It's, I have a remarkable new way of storing energy. Okay, this is what this is about. This is a group in Australia that have um, discerned from the literature that um, hydrogen is a great source for hydrogen fuel cells, of course. So to store it, you you liquefy it, all right? Mm-hmm. And so you've mm-hmm. got liquid hydrogen, right? Which is very difficult to do. Sometimes it's energy intensive and all that other stuff. But if you could connect hydrogen to another element, in this case, um, nitrogen, and create ammonia, which you can also liquefy, mm-hmm. for the same volume, you have four times as much energy. And then you can re is it Access. costly to do that? Well, they go into that. And so how do you do that? And so what, what they have uh, worked out in uh, CSIRO labs um, in Canberra and other places too throughout Australia is you can take sunlight and use it to split water. And when you do that, of course, you get oxygen. It goes mm-hmm. off this way. And you get hydrogen. Now, the hydrogen can be combined with nitrogen. Now, that's part of the habit. Yeah, UV there. light does that, right? Yeah. Right. So you can actually use what's available without adding too much energy to the system Mm -hmm. and produce ammonia, which today is a very expensive process, which generates lots of CO2 because you have to use a lot of energy in order to get your hydrogen and in order to force it onto the nitrogen molecule, Mm -hmm. which is what these old German processes do. 
Is that and, the Haber process? Yeah, the Haber-Bosch process. That's correct. Mm-hmm. And this paper goes through that process and shows you how much CO2 is generated per liter of uh, ammonia this way and how much is mm-hmm. generated this way. And it's a much, much lower CO2 footprint for the methodology that this group uh, recommends. And so you can store ammonia basically anywhere in, of course, safe containers and accessing it and then removing the hydrogen and putting the nitrogen back in the air and using the hydrogen for the fuel cells. And that's their, that's their proposal mm. for creating a new energy system. And I think it's very exciting because they've got a lot of support from the government for this. And it's, it's clean compared to what we do today. Mm-hmm. And of course, it's even cleaner than some of the uh, industries which look clean, like photosyn- photovoltaics or uh, wind power. You still have to use a lot of energy to make the photovoltaics or to make the blades for the windmills and stuff. In this case, it's, it's all the reagents are there. All you have to do is cleverly access them and then use them to store. Mm. So here's a storage system and an access system for energy that's um, – probably going to come online within the next 10 years, at least in Australia and perhaps in many other places as well. So that's my pick. And it's because they have more sunlight than any other place? No, it's, be- <laughs> no, it's because they were, they've were they had a blackout in 2016. They had mm-hmm. an absolute blackout in that country, and they have more coal deposits in northern Australia than almost anywhere else in the world, and they export almost all of that. So they're energy rich in some ways, but they're also – Stressed in many other ways, and and the and they're spread out through the entire uh, island, if you want to call it an island, because it's not really considered a it's continent. A continent, isn't it? Well, well, I don't think it's island continent. An <laughs> island continent, but I don't think it's. Well, there are seven continents, and is is Australia actually one of those continents? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I believe, okay, let's make it a continent. The, there are only twenty three million people that live there, or twenty four million people, and they're spread throughout the coastline of of Australia, basically from. Uh, Brisbane all the way out to uh, Adelaide or even beyond that uh, Perth. So this, this for them, this would be perfect because you're right. They've got all the sunlight mm-hmm. they can possibly use and more. They can use that as an energy source to split the water. They can extract nitrogen from the air very easily and putting the two together. That's how they came up with this. It is a continent. Yes. Okay, fine. I, I stand corrected. For sure. <laughs> so this is a science article. It is. Ammonia, a renewable fuel made from sun, air, and water, could power the globe without carbon. Look at that. Well, look. At how many years do we need? It's in existence. Now, this is an operational energy generating system on a micro scale. All it has to do is scale up. And if you read the article, there's a lot of encouragement throughout the Australian government for making this go forward because Australia then becomes one of the sources for all of this. Yeah, right? very interesting. Cool. Yeah, it would be very yeah, interesting. Neat. All right. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. Kathy, what do you have? I have something that also could have just been a follow-up, but I picked a uh, portmanteau. <laughs> so last week we talked about this and I, I had thought that it was something different, but you guys set me straight. So I found it's been – a, a featured word for several different weeks on a word a day. Originally, a portmanteau was a court official who carried the robes of a king, and then it became the case that had two hinged compartments. And Lewis Carroll was the one who used it uh, in Through the Looking Glass, where Humpty Dumpty explains to Alice that slithy, slithy is uh, combined from lithe and slimy. And so <laughs> some everyday portmanteau are brunch, and smog and motel. <laughs> yep. Okay, so ah. to get at what I thought um, a portmanteau was, what I tried to find something and and uh, I found two possibilities. And one is matryoshka words, where there's a word inside of another word, or a kangaroo word. Um, and so, for instance, uh, so kangaroo word, the word inside would be the joey. So war <laughs> is the joey of the kangaroo word award. Or script is the joey of subscription. Mm. So that's what I had always thought a portmanteau was, but now I know it has this broader meaning. And then, by coincidence, this week, A Word a Day has uh, portmanteau words again. So uh, this week it was Rurban, Squiggle, Palimony, Guestimate, and Contraption. So, so is wow. it any fusion almost of two words in to, Pretty make, much, to make a yeah. new word? Yeah. Yeah. As, for instance, the word portmanteau, which is a French uh, port city along the Côte d'Azur. 
<laughs> I thought we also said podcast was a portmanteau, right? <laughs> no, it's not, but it certainly looks that way, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, it is. It's a po- it's the combination of pod, uh, you know, a pod and broadcast. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Hmm. Neat. Yeah, I know you had emailed those to me, and um, so I'm glad you put them in as a pick. Everyone could hear. Uh, my pick is a new podcast, uh, which mm-hmm. is part of uh, Microbe TV. It's called Curiosity. It's put together by Calvin Yeager, who was a graduate graduate student, a PhD student in Craig Cameron's lab at Penn State. And uh, he writes, he just launched it last week. Uh, it's an informal but informative science show for everyone about biology, chemistry, virology, technology, and general science in a lighthearted and digestible way. It's inspired by podcasts like Twiv, Big Picture Science, and If I Were You. So it's, he does it with some guests um, from around Pennsylvania and outside of Pennsylvania, from Penn State, for example. And here's the thing. He's a PhD student. He's doing it weekly. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Good so luck with that. He, so he first approached me months ago. He wrote, I want to do this. And he sent me a list of his next year's worth of episodes. He's got them all planned out. Good heavens. I said, good luck. A weekly thing is a lot for a grad student. But he's yeah. launched and, and he launches on Thursdays. It's a lot for a senior investigator also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. And his co-hosts. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. But uh, I wish him luck, and uh, it's fun, and he's going to obviously learn doing this, but we, we've put him on Microbe TV, and he's got his own website, which is, um, oh, I've lost it here. Let's go back there. Ascienceshow.com. Yeah, ascienceshow.com. And the first episode is, Do Scientists Always Agree? Of course. Do we, uh, on this inaugural God episode, damn right we do. What is a scientist? <laughs> what does that person do? Are there any misrepresentations of science or the work done by scientists? Nah, never. Never. <laughs> Come on. To say, do they ever agree? No, sometimes. And, right. and now seeing the little logo, um, his title is sort of a portmanteau because it's Curio yeah. and then SCI for site and then City. So yeah, it's yeah. it's – it's nice. Because curiosity is normally spelled without With a C. With O-U-S. Curiosity. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. So it's not curiosity, just like the word sounds. Yeah, it's I. It's curiosity. It's a portmanteau. <laughs> See. Nice. We also have a listener pick from Chaim, who sends us Today Explained, a news podcast by Vox, aired an interview with Tony Fauci about getting your flu vaccine. And so he provides links to download in the feed as well. Thanks for that. T- uh, Steve, you want to pick anything? You, you read anything lately? Good? You read a good book? <laughs> Gosh, I'd have to think. You, read a, you sure. must have read a book or you're reading a book, I, right? I, he writes do, books. Sure. He writes books. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm reading a, a compendium of, of uh, quanta, uh, you know, short, short stories. You know that. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Quanta magazine, you, right? Yeah. So there's there's books Quantum now. Quantum magazine but I, compendium. So they're, they're Is there fun. a duplicate of that somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> You're funny. Every time he opens the page, that page opens. I can't get this. You know. <laughs> of all the articles that they've written over the years. Right? Yeah, it's not all of them, but I mean, it's select. A lot of them. Set, oh, okay. Yeah, there's he, two books even of it. You know, hmm. they're they're fun. You like it? Yeah, I do. It's good. Yeah, okay. Learn about other that. sciences as yeah. well. All right, that's Twiv five thirty. You could find it at microbe.tv slash twiv. And that's where all the show notes are, links and stuff. I know you're driving and listening and, and exercising, so you can't look at the, the, the web page. But if you ever need to find something out, uh, that's the place to go. Uh, and you can send your questions and comments to twiv at microbe.tv. And if you really like what we do, consider supporting us financially. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. There are a number of ways that you can do that, including like give a buck a month at Patreon. And you can then take care of uh, Dixon's commute. Just kidding. <laughs> I could walk from my house to here. It's free, isn't it? You could pay for my shoes. <laughs> yeah, they wear out. They wear out. It's true. It's true. Our guest today has been Steve Goff from here at Columbia University and the Howard Hughes Medical Institutes. Thank you, Steve, for coming back. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Great. Great school. Nice work. Very nice. Yep. Dixon de Pommier is at trichinella.org and thelivingriver.org. Indeed. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. Dixon can walk home from here. 
you can. You know how lucky you are? I used to. <laughs> now you got too old, right? Probably. Probably. So how many miles would it be? It's a mile and a quarter from here to my house. Oh, that's wow. nothing. Wow. I can see that's it through great. the arch of the bridge. Yeah, he walks yeah. up up the street, crosses the bridge. bridge. And Are you home. still allowed to walk on the bridge? Oh, okay. uh, yeah, but they're doing a lot of repairs on that right now, and I, I don't recommend it. That's the George Washington Bridge? The George Washington and the, Bridge. And, but uh, you live a little farther, Steve. I do it seven miles. Not so far. Not bad. Too far to walk. But too far yeah. to walk. You guys have the right idea. A bridge too far to walk. I live 38 <laughs> miles away. I, you do. It's just. You do. Horrible. Yes. Just horrible. Wow. Oh, well, you get to listen you. to a lot of podcasts on the way. Well, that's what <laughs> got me listening, and that's why we're doing this. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. And this would be a really good time to start saying over and over in your head, do the TWIV poll, renew your ASV dues. Do the TWIV poll, renew your ASV dues, <laughs> right. so that you can do that as soon as the podcast ends. That's right. Yes, Kathy. Right at the yes, end Kathy. here. Right at the <laughs> end here. Right. Uh, Alan Dove is with us today. He's at turbidplaque.com. He's on Twitter as Alan Dove. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Thanks to ASM for their support and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another twib is viral. It's Kathy, let's talk about titles. You right. and you and I, right? Everybody must his stone. Everybody must his stone. Okay, I get that now. I didn't get it before. Those who live in capsid shouldn't his stone. Oh, like throw stones. Okay. He who reverse transcribes cast his stone. Integrate or die. A hush fell over the genome. Silent, not deadly. Casting the first his stones. Mm. Not sure. Mm. None of them are great, right? Yeah. Because we didn't really talk about, you know, his stone and like, He's getting stoned. You know, it's not so. it's not a hush on the genome either, right? Oh, I no. guess it is. It's just not integrated. This could We're be trying the, to come up with a title, Steve. No, no. The sounds of silence. A hush, a hush fell over the gene. I would, I would make my title The Sounds of Silence because we've talked about silencing, and this is a podcast. It's sounds. Sounds of Didn't silence. Didn't we have a no. already to The Sounds of Silence? I don't Is that no. copyrighted? <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> Let them sue us. The Sounds of Viral Silence? Some of my seminars start out with the title, Quiet, Please. <laughs> Quiet, Please, yeah. And when they, when they find one that oh, absolutely... That could work. Quiet, Please. Yeah. Shut up! <laughs> do you want to do Quiet, Please? Quiet, Please. Yeah, right. Is that okay with you? Please turn okay? off Please turn off your histones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're not you actually turning off. You might have to include part thing. of this as an as Easter egg so people understand why, but... <laughs> you could do it as a portmanteau. <laughs> right, right, right.